Psalm 126. Psalm 126. When you find your place, once again, let's burn off them Christmas calories and let's stand up and read God's Word together. Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. It says, Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Let's read that again together. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Let's pray together this morning. Lord, we love you, we bless you, and we thank you for your word. Your word, God, is forever settled in heaven. Your word is truth. God, it is your word that will endure forever. The grass withers and the flower fades away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Lord, I pray and I ask this morning that as we look at your word together, that you, Holy Spirit, would speak to our hearts that you would anoint this time that we have together. God, please open up our eyes to see wondrous things from your law. God, please open up our hearts, Lord. Unite our heart to fear your name, God. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to our lives through your word today by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. This morning I want to preach to you on weeping, sowing, and reaping. Weeping, sowing, and reaping. We have in this song, it's called a song of ascents or a song song of degrees. And these were these psalms that were sung as people were making their way to the temple as they were on their way traveling to the temple and and going up the steps of the temple, they had these songs of degrees where they would read or sing a psalm unto the Lord in the worship that was at the temple. And as you read this psalm, you you realize that this is speaking, the, the person that wrote it, who we don't know exactly who wrote it. The scripture doesn't tell us if it was David or who it was, but tradition tells us that it was the man named Ezra. Ezra, who was a leading figure in the children of Israel coming back from the Babylonian captivity. He writes this song as a remembrance of all of the good things that God had done for them in bringing them back out of captivity. Look at what it says in verse 1. It says, when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, it was so good it seemed like a dream. That God had turned this thing around. That for 70 years we dwelt in Babylon. We were in a foreign land and now God has brought us back. And we were carried back. Not only did he bring them back, but Cyrus sent them back and he sent them back with money to rebuild the temple. Amen? And so Ezra is here speaking, or whoever wrote this psalm, is speaking. It was like a dream when you brought us back that God had turned it around. And I love what the writer Charles Spurgeon, that famous preacher, he spoke about this verse and he spoke about it in terms of the new covenant. When God brought us back out of captivity, it was like a dream. It was too good to be true. How many remember when you got saved? 
How many remember? Some of us need to go back and remember that day, don't we? Some of us need to go back and remember what it was like when the Lord brought us back out of captivity, when he brought us out of sin, when he brought us out of bondage. We need to remember that, amen, lest our heart get cold, lest we forget where he brought us from, lest we forget the power of God at work in our lives. Amen. The psalmist said it was like a dream. When he brought us back, verse 2, it says, Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. We see the joy of their returning that even the nations around them were saying God had done great things for them. Even unbelievers were giving God praise for what God had done in the life of the children of Israel. Even the heathen, even even the nations around them were saying, look at what God has done for them. And I believe there is a place where you and I can be so full of God that even unbelievers take notice and say, man, God's doing something there. There's something at work there, amen? And I believe that's where you and I got to get. We've got to get to a place here you see even the nations were saying, look at what God has done for them. Look at what God has done for them. And you and I, we need to get to a place where people see there's something different in us. And this is a much different position than they were in when they were led captive. Now their mouth is filled with laughter and it is filled with singing and with joy. There's a psalm that we read. Turn with me to Psalm 137. It's much different than what they sang on their way out. It's much different than what they sang just a few generations earlier. In Psalms 137, it says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it, for there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song, and those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? They hung their harps upon the willows. They were not going to sing anymore. And, and they were asking him, Sing us one of those songs that you used to sing in Zion. But they said, How can we sing a song? in a foreign land but now you see they're heading back and now their mouth is full of laughter and it is full of singing unto the Lord and we see look at what verse 4 says bring back our captivity O Lord as the streams in the south those who sow in tears shall reap in joy those who sow in tears we see it's out of many times the greatest sorrows that God brings us to the greatest joys. It's out of the deepest places of pain that it's in those places that the Lord reveals to us His power and His glory. As the psalmist said in Psalms 30 and verse 5, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. It's the weeping in the night that brings about the promise of joy in the morning. It's the weeping at night that brings about that promise where in the morning everything is turned around. As we see... In these verses, we see in this psalm a promise. We see in these psalms a type of spiritual law. He that sows in tears shall reap in joy. As we come to the close of this year, this is the last Sunday of 2021. I've had this growing and increasing burden on my heart to see people saved. 
And not only to see people saved, but my heart is grieved over the backslidden condition of people in the church. Backslidden. Backslidden. And it's grieving. But my heart is burdened to see people saved. Not halfway saved. You can't be halfway saved. Not halfway delivered. Amen. But fully born again. Not attached just to the culture of the church, but knowing the Christ of the church. Amen. Because there's a lot of people that are attached to the culture within a church. They're attached through love ties or family ties, but they're not connected to the head. They're not connected to Christ. They're not connected to the Spirit of God. Amen? And my heart is burdened to see people say, how many understand this is the reason Jesus came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. That is the purpose for why he died on the cross. That is why he came to the earth. And if it's his desire that no one perish, if it's his will that no one be lost, then it has to be our will. It must be our burden. If it's, if it's the desire of the Lord to see people saved, it has to be our desire. And then we need to understand that if it is not our desire, that there is something desperately sick on the inside of us. There is something wrong deep down in our heart, and we need to come back to the altar, and we need to get a broken heart again. We need to break up the fallow ground if we don't want to see people saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. If the Lord is willing for the entire month of January, we are going to be focusing on revival. 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 Personal revival. Corporate revival. And I want to warn you, revival has a cost. There's a cost to revival. There is a cost to it. If you don't want it, then... You're not going to get it. But there's a cost to it. It will disrupt your life. It will disrupt your routine. It will disrupt your formality and your tradition. It will disrupt it. Amen. There's a cost to revival. It will disrupt your family. There's a, there's a cost to be paid. I'm 37 years old. I've heard all kinds of stories about moves of God, and I'm tired of hearing stories, and I want to see moves of God. I've experienced the fire of God in my life. I've experienced the fire of God in my heart, and I want everybody in this church to experience it. Amen. I want everybody sitting in these pews or these chairs to have an encounter with the fire of God because the fire of God will clean up your life. The fire of God will stir you up. The fire of God will burden you for the loss when you get on fire for him. Amen. When the fire of God falls, you don't have to ask people, beg people, poke people to do things for God. They want to do stuff for God. You don't feel like you're under obligation. You want to do what God has called you to do. Amen. And we need the fire of God. Amen. Amen. We'll get into what I'm going to preach about here in a second. But man, we need to have his will be our will. We see in these verses a type of spiritual law that the psalmist says to us here. We must be serious about a harvest. We see in these verses some great realities. Look at verse 5. It says, Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves 
with him. See, the first thing that he mentions is weeping. Weeping. They that sow in tears, he that goes forth weeping. Weeping is an indication of pain or discomfort. Weeping is an indication of a burden. Weeping is an indication of a felt need that causes you to cry, that causes you to feel the need. And you and I, we must have a burden. I'm not talking about the burden of sin. I'm not talking about the burden of guilt. I'm not talking about a burden of peer pressure. I'm not talking about any of those type of burdens. Those type of burdens are bondage. But the burden that you and I must have is that we must have the same burden that the Lord Jesus had. We must have a burden. And when was the last time, when was the last time you wept over somebody that was not saved? When was the last time that you were grieved over the condition of our nation to the point where you wept for the things that were going on? And that is the type of burden that you and I need to carry. Not sin, not guilt, not shame, not peer pressure, but we've got to have the burden of the Lord that causes us to to weep. Amen. Jesus, Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Jesus stood at a tomb of a man named Lazarus and he was grieved. It says his spirit moved in him and he wept over Lazarus, even knowing he was about to raise him from the dead. We read that Jesus stood overlooking Jerusalem and he wept over Jerusalem and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stone the prophets and kill those who are sent to you. Jesus, we read, in the garden of Gethsemane was so overwhelmed that he cried unto the Lord in agony. And the book of Hebrews says, With tears coming out of his eyes, he was man, a man with a burden. And what was on the other side of those tears? What was on the other end of those tears? It was a harvest. Amen. You and I, you and I must get our burden back. We must get our tender heart back. We must get our desire back, those who sow in tears, those who go forth weeping. Charles Spurgeon said this, winners of souls, winners of souls are first weepers for souls. Winners of souls are first weepers for souls. We read in Psalms 119, 136, it says, Rivers of water run down my eyes because men do not keep your law. Rivers of waters run down my eyes. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 9 and 1, Oh, that my eyes were a fountain. Oh, that I would weep night and day for the sins of my people, for the transgressions of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 8, it says that when she was in labor, she brought forth children. And I want you to understand the principle here. Labor always brings forth children. Travail always goes before birth. There has to be a weeping before there is a reaping. There has to be a burden. Amen. Amen. And I believe it is true in the spiritual. That it's out of travailing. It's out of the weeping. It's out of the interceding of God's people that souls are born again into the kingdom. Amen. Amen. We see in verse 5 and 6, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing. You see, secondly, 
Secondly, there's weeping. And then number two, sowing of seed. Sowing of seed. He goes forth weeping, bearing precious seed is what the King James says. I love that. It says bearing precious seed. Bearing precious seed. And we understand that there cannot be a harvest. There cannot be a reaping. There cannot be a harvest unless somebody sows seed. You cannot reap a harvest unless you sow seed. It would be foolish for a farmer to sit in his house with bags full of seeds and then say, oh God, give me a harvest. Oh God, give me a harvest. Oh God, let me see a harvest out in my field. You cannot have a harvest if you don't sow seed. You have to dig up the ground. You have to move it. You have to put the seed down in there. You have to cover it back. And the water has to fall before the seed can produce a harvest. Amen? And I want to say this to you and I. It doesn't matter how sincere we are. It doesn't matter how much we pray. It doesn't even matter how much weeping we do. If we do not get the seed outside of the barn, if we do not get it planted into the ground, there will be no harvest. Amen? Amen? Amen. We've got to get the seed in the soil. Amen. You see this morning, the word of God, the word of God is the seed. Romans 1 and verse 16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. It is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the seed. The gospel is is the power of God whereby faith rises up in the heart of an individual that hears it. And without the preaching, without the getting the news out, without somebody coming under the influence or the hearing of the gospel, they cannot be saved. Amen? No matter how much we pray, no matter how much we labor, do other things... If people who need the gospel don't hear the gospel, they will not be saved. Amen? And like Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not embarrassed about it. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to keep my mouth shut about it because it is the power of God unto salvation. People stoned him. People kicked him out of town. The Jews rejected him, but he would not keep his mouth shut. Amen? Amen. And we need to get to a place where we are the same way. Friends will no longer be your friends anymore because of the gospel. Family will not want to be around you because of the gospel. Right? Right? Co-workers will look at you like you are strange because of the gospel. But Paul said, I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You and I need to bear the reproach of the Lord Jesus. We need to go outside of the camp bearing the reproach of Christ. We need to be willing to say, look, I am, as the song says, a Jesus freak. I am, as they used to say, one of those holy rollers, amen. I am one of those people. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. 
And we have to sow the seed of God's word. James 1 and verse 18, it says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. Of his own will he brought us forth, what? By the word of truth. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The word of God is incorruptible seed. It is seed by which we are born again. Amen. Amen. And as I say in one of my favorite verses to remind myself of, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. says, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 5, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. One sows, another waters, but God gives the increase. You understand that's what we are? We are sowers and waterers. And there comes a time, thank God, in His grace and in His mercy, we get a reap. We get a sea soul saved. Amen. It's one of the most glorious things to ever experience, to see somebody saved, to see somebody born again, transformed, changed in their life, life changed. But you realize before that ever takes place, many times there's somebody that's been sowing in their life. There's somebody that's been watering in their life. There's somebody, and at the right time, at the right moment, God gives the harvest. God gives the increase. But there was sowing before that. There was watering. There was weeping. There was sowing but God, God gave the harvest. Amen? This morning, how many want to see, see people saved? How many want to see Genuine revival. If we want to see that, we're going to have to start changing. Amen? We're going to have to break up the fallow ground. We're going to have to. Amen. If we want to see that, we can't just keep doing things the same way. Right? We can do things the same way till Jesus comes. Right? But we want to hear what God wants us to do. We want to do what He has called us to do. And I don't think that the Lord has called me to shepherd and pastor just to keep people comfortable in their walk with God. I don't think that's my calling. Right? Amen? 
I don't think that's what he placed me here to do or placed me in the ministry to do. Right? So, I'm going to have revival. I'm going to have revival. Whether you have it or not. Amen? I'm going to have it. I'm going to. Whether you go along with me, I'm having it. Amen? I'm going to have it. Amen? Amen. I'm going to have it. And if we want to see harvest, there's got to be weeping. There's got to be. There's got to be a teardrop fall on the ground and a seed go where that tear is. There's got to be tears fall down. There's got to be a burden. There's got to be. There has to be a burden. Because without travail, without labor, there cannot be no childbirth. Amen? Without the contractions and all of that stuff, nothing will be born, nothing will be brought forth. So we've got to have a burden. We've got to weep. We've got to sow. We've got to sow out here. We've got to have people in the church that smell like pot. Amen? Oh, 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 oh. Amen? You've got to get sinners in the church. You've got to have sinners come in contact with the gospel. Amen? Amen? Amen. If any of you ever smell like pot, you'll be hearing from me. That's all coal rain smells like. And you know what it reminded me of as we were Christmas shopping? These people need Christ. Amen? Because I used to smell like pot all the time. These people need Jesus. Amen? They need him. We see here, last verse in Psalms 125. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, 126, I'm sorry, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You see this reaping that comes. The result is... He will bring forth his sheaves rejoicing. He'll have them underneath his arms. He'll see the labor. He'll see it. His sheaves full of the harvest. He'll see it and he'll come rejoicing. And all that weeping and all that sowing is worth the harvest. Amen. All of that that took place is worth it. Every bit of it. Right? Every bit of it. That the farmer got out, got up and it was cold outside and he didn't want to do it and he didn't want to go out but he put on his overalls and he went out and he began to plow his field and it didn't look like the sun was going to come out but he did it anyway. It didn't look like rain was going to fall but he did it anyway because that's what he's called to do and finally at the right time the rain began to fall and the air began to get the right consistency and things begin to sprout and to Come up, you and I. We've got to get out in the field. We've got to weep. We've got to sow if we want to carry those sheaves of harvest. Amen? Amen. And I want to see this. I want to see souls saved. As we're coming up on a new year, a new year, I want to see people saved. Amen. Give us faith to sow seed. Give us a heart that is broken and burdened. And let us see a harvest. And God, give us souls.
and give us souls. We praise you, God. Let's, if Stacy would come to the piano. stand with me today invite you to come to this altar right now. I invite you to lay some stuff down from this past year. Lay it down. I'm going to invite you to come get a burden back. Would you come right now? Would you come?
holy, holy, holy. allow the Holy Spirit to speak right now.
next Wednesday night we're going to be having church and unless something changes I'm going to be speaking on the subject of prayer which is, goes right along with what I spoke about this morning but I encourage you to come and be a part of that Gonna, we're going to break up the fallow ground. The fallow ground is that ground that's not been touched. It's overgrown with weeds. And you don't just go and start putting stuff in the fallow ground. You got to plow. Right? You got to put a farming implement down in it and break it up. And get the hard soil soft again. Man, that's what we're going to be doing in January. We're going to be breaking up the fallow ground. Amen. 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 Let's pray. It's the last Sunday of the month. We will not be having our prayer meeting this evening. I look forward to seeing you Wednesday night. As I said, we're going to be focusing on prayer. and We'll have a time of prayer at the close of our service. I encourage you to come and be a part of that. Let's lift our hands together and let's pray. Father, we love you today. We praise you, God. God, we're ex I'm expecting. I'm expecting so many things. God, I want to see you move. I want to see our lives changed. I want to see our, our family strong in the Lord. I want to see souls saved, God. I want, to have, I want all that you have for me. I want all that you have for me in my life. That you desire me to walk in in my life. I want all that you have for this church. That you desire for this church, God. I want it, Lord. And I ask you to give it to us. I ask you, God, to do it. Lord, I pray that you would go with your people. I pray that this word, God, would stay in us. God, that it would stay in us, Lord, and that you would use us, use it to stir us up throughout this entire week, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning in our time of worship and the word. And I would encourage you, if you need anything, if you need prayer or whatever you may need, we are here for you. And I want to personally encourage you to reach out to us with any prayer requests or, or questions that you may have about the Lord. Thank you and have a blessed day.